Please open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 24. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 12. <laughs> Woo, I got ahead of myself there, about six months. So let me just say before we start this morning, um, I notice there's a lot of, uh, a few new faces here this morning, and uh, before we enter into the topic we're going to talk about this morning, I just want you to know that um, here at Calvary Chapel, our habit, if you will, is to teach through the Bible, book by book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And this is how we learn about the things of God and how we learn to live for the Lord and how we feed our spirits every week. So we kind of, as we go through the Bible, there are topics that are really easy and some that are really fun to deal with, and there are topics that are very difficult at times to deal with, and sometimes there's just topics that just seem kind of strange. But <clears throat> the idea is we take the good, the bad, and the ugly, because it's all in the Bible, right? There's victory, there's failure, there's every spectrum of life found in this wonderful book that we study. So this morning, if you're in chapter 12 of Matthew, um, we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. We saw that uh, Jesus had been healing people. Um, you know, Jesus always functioned, that's what I love about him, he was kind of outside the box. You know, nobody could really capture him and put him in his place, if you will. Every time they think they might have had him, he, he showed them different. He would heal people on the Sabbath. He would do good things on the Sabbath. And when he did these good things, there would be those religious leaders, if you will, that would try to trap him. You see, they were afraid of him. They were terrified of him. Because they knew that the people loved him. They knew that he loved them. And he had this great following that followed him wherever he went. And that was very intimidating and threatening to the religious standard of the day, if you will. There's one thing I like to stress among us when we're together, and that is, I don't want to bring you religion. I want to bring you relationship. This is the difference between knowing and serving God because we love him and we want to do those things to please him. Just like our spouses, you know, it's not a burden to love our spouses and to bless them. We, we desire to do that. And I think that's why the Lord designed marriage the way he did, as a picture, in a sense, of our relationship with him, that you and I can serve the Lord because we choose to, not because we have to. And so oftentimes when you have this religious attitude, if you will, of keeping all the rules, it can become heavy. It can become a weight upon us because how many of you know each and every one of us comes short of the expectations of religion because no one's perfect. And so we lean on grace and we see that Jesus had been healing on the Sabbath. We see that in the, in the middle of the chapter, uh, he, he knew in his heart that the religious leaders were beginning to plot against him, to kill him, to remove the threat of their little kingdom that they had established. So I want to pick up our study in verse 22 of chapter 12. I'll just read down through here a bit. It says, then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. And all of the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. 
If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come to you. So let's stop right there. What an awesome demonstration we have here of the power of Jesus, of the authority that Jesus has. Now, this isn't the first time. As we've gone through Matthew, we've seen several instances where he was confronted with demonic influences, and he delivered the people from those oppressive spirits that were possessing them. And in our story today, he comes upon a man who uh, he says he's demon-possessed. And it also says he was blind. And it also says that he was mute. So he couldn't see and he couldn't speak, and he's possessed by a demon. Now, my goodness, here we are in 2023, and we're talking about demons and evil spirits, really? Can this be true? Is it real? Is it just a metaphor? Is it another word for mental illness or disabilities? Well, I believe the Bible, every word that it says is true. And if the Lord tells us in his word that this man was demon-possessed, then I believe that it was true. Can people today be demon-possessed? I believe so. You know, here's something that's interesting, food for thought. During the time when Christ was yet to come, the first time, and while he was here, and after his departure into heaven, there was a huge increase in demonic activity in the world, especially in the Jewish culture around the area of Israel there. There were many people who were demon-possessed. There were many witches and a lot of witchcraft and a lot of things going on. Now, today we love to celebrate all those things with a great holiday that we spend billions of dollars every year, believe it or not, on this thing we call Halloween. Did you know that last year the United States spent $4.5 billion buying Halloween things? And to what end? To have a little bit of fun, perhaps. But I've noticed since I was a little boy and mama would throw a sheet over me and cut two holes in it for my eyes and I'd be a ghost. And that's how we went trick-or-treating. Well, it's come a long way, hasn't it? People decorate their houses. They dress their kids up like very evil, demonic, scary-looking things. And we go out and we celebrate darkness. You might say, oh boy, you're a narrow-minded guy. Well, I'm just telling you like I see it. We give a lot less attention to Christmas these days and the birth of Jesus than we do that other holiday. I think it's kind of a, I think it speaks very loudly of where we are spiritually as a culture. Even as in the time of Christ, when demonic activity was at a high, Jesus said, when I come back, and he is coming back, he's coming back for us. He's coming back for the church. And the Bible tells us that during that time frame in history, just before he returns, the demonic activity would also be on the rise at that time in history too which is the time in history that we're living in right now. If you don't see it, you must be living under a rock because things have changed. Innocence is gone. There's no more boundaries. There's no more black and white. It's all gray. But let me tell you something. In God's word, it's not gray. His word stands forever and ever. It doesn't change. What was wrong 3,000 years ago is wrong today. 
What was right 3,000 years ago is right today. These are things that cannot be moved. They're permanent. They're fixed. These are the things we live by. But the culture that we live in today is much different. As a matter of fact, it's all up to your imagination, really, what your reality is. You can be anybody. You can be anything that you choose to be today. When I start hearing that they're putting litter boxes in the kids' school bathrooms for those who want to identify as a kitty cat so they can go to the bathroom in a litter box, I kind of wonder what kind of insanity are we living in? Now, you think I'm kidding. This is a real thing. Because it's all about you. It's all about your feelings. It's all about what you think you want to be. This is totally, totally opposite of what the Bible teaches us. You and I are created in God's image. We have a body and a soul and a spirit. Nothing else does except the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You and I have been created in God's image because we are a three-in-one being. No other being that God ever created is like you and me. We are unique. We are precious in His sight. And the goal of our world today is to tear that down. The goal of our world today is to bring you and me back down to an animal status where all we have is our feelings and our flesh. To put the spirit to sleep, in a sense. And so this is the times that we're living in. And as we look at this text right here, we see that this, these people brought this man to Jesus who was demon-possessed. And it tells us that Jesus healed him. Now, if I was writing a commentary on this, I might write four or five chapters on how Jesus did it. Right? First, he did a little dance and a bunch of sign language and hummed a few chants here and there and went through all kinds of flip-flopping around and put his hand all over the guy, and then he was healed. Hmm. <clears throat> I've seen that before. Doesn't say that, though, does it? And he healed him so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. He willed it. He chose it for this man. And it happened immediately. You know, like I said earlier, you can't put Jesus in a box. He can do it however he wants to do it. I just think it's awesome that he does it, don't you? I think it's awesome that he heals us. And when I say that, you probably, first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, your broken bones and your arthritis and your back and, you know, physical things. But he heals us in our minds, too. He heals us in our thinking. He heals us in our spirits. He brings our spirit alive again, which otherwise our spirit was not. It was asleep. It was comatose. It was separated from God until Jesus healed it for us by going to the cross. Now, if a man came in here, down this aisle, flailing and going through all kinds of things, and the Lord just touched him right there in front of us instantly and healed him. I think of the legion, the man that Jesus came across that had legion of demonic entities in him. And Jesus cast them all out, and the people of the town came out and found this man sitting in his right mind with his clothes on. Would that not blow you away? It would. It would blow us away. It would make this passage so real to us. Now, that's probably not going to happen. I didn't hire an actor to come in and kind of do that for us today. But we're reading about this particular account here. And I want to be able to take you there. I want you to be able to imagine in your mind how powerful this truly was. 
Look how the people responded. In verse 23, the multitudes were amazed. They were blown away. Their jaws dropped. They'd never seen anything quite like that. And they asked the question, could this be the son of David? You know, the Bible teaches us that there are non-material beings in the service of the devil. Now, there's only one devil, there's only one Satan, there's only one Lucifer, all the same. But there are many demons. As a matter of fact, we believe the Bible tells us that a third part of the heavens, of the angelic realm, rebelled against God. And that they were judged for their rebellion, and they were cast out. And that many of them were cast into the earth. Many of them were cast to the earth. Jude is an interesting book. And Jude, it says that the angels who did not keep their position of authority, but they abandoned their own home. These he hath kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter said, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. We went through the book of Revelation together recently, and we got to see towards the end of the book when those pits were opened up, and all those demonic creatures came out from the the earth, and we got to understand that there truly is a place where they are held captive today, even this very moment. Interesting word. You ever hear the word abyss? I'm sure you have. That's the ocean, or the sea. The word sea actually is the word abyss. And the word abyss means prison, or a place of holding, a place of incarceration. And the Bible tells us that it's in the depths of the earth where this place of incarceration is, and that the abyss, the sea, if you will, that's the walls. That's the gates. They cannot escape. As a matter of fact, when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, it tells us that there will be no more sea. There'll be no more abyss. Because judgment will have happened. Now, it doesn't say there won't be an ocean. But it does say there will no longer be a need for that abyss. Because those angels, those fallen angels, will be judged at that time. God will not spare them. So what's the deal with these demons that we call them? And, you know, sometimes we think of it in a sense of fiction. There's a lot of movies. There's a lot of reality programs where, you know, you can go into old hotels and they chase ghosts around in there with their little devices. And I'm sure you guys have seen that. Stupid. But let me just say this. The enemy... Our adversary and his minions are experts at counterfeit. They're experts at imitating things. They can imitate your grandma who's been dead 30 years. They can imitate a prophet. They can imitate an angel of light, the Bible says. So when we see these programs and we hear these crazy stories and we wonder, what's going on with that? Are there really ghosts of people haunting places? No. They're demonic spirits. They're, they're, they're faking someone else. They're impersonating them. Why would they do that? Well, because I'll tell you what, if you know anything, the first thing that does is it brings doubts to what the Bible says. It causes us to question God's word right away. How can there be ghosts? The Bible doesn't talk about ghosts. The Bible must be wrong because the sky's little indicator said there was a ghost there. And so thus, the world becomes deceived. It becomes desensitized. 
It becomes complacent about these things that we're talking about this morning. Now, have you ever heard people say, well, you know, she's a real nice gal, but boy, she's always wrestled with her demons. We use that phrase to acknowledge the fact that we struggle. We have shortcomings. We sin. We make mistakes. We have bad habits. And so we phrase it like that. It's almost kind of a sense, a way for me to take the blame and put it on something else. It's those demons that are causing me to do that. Now, in some church circles today, people would say, that's ridiculous. There's no demons. Man, you guys are living in the dark ages. Wake up. They don't believe in them. They will pass right over this. And then there's other groups on the other side of that spectrum who see a demon in everybody. They see a demon under every rock. Every little thing has a demon behind it. Now somewhere in between those two, the truth lie. And we got a good example of it here this morning. These spirits, these fallen angels, they envy you because you're made in God's image. They envy you because you have a body. And because you have a soul. And because you have a spirit. Because they're just a soulish being. And they they desire to be clothed with a body of flesh. That's why demon possession happens. For no other reason. Because they want to be clothed in a body of flesh. Because they envy you and I, and they hate Jesus. And they want to destroy our lives because we love Jesus. If you study the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation and all everything in between, one of the things that you'll see is that Satan has made several attempts along the historical lines to interrupt God's plan of the Messiah coming. Matter of fact, it started in the book of Genesis. There's many instances in the Bible where Satan, or his minions, if you will, have tried to interfere with God's plan of salvation. Even to the point of allowing people to think that Jesus truly is dead. He was a good guy. He loved people, but he's dead. They killed him. And when Satan thought that he had won the battle, guess what happened? Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered death. And for the last time, once and for all, he knew that there's no way he could defeat God's son. Now, I know that in battle, in war, and I, you know, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, I I get a little, I don't know, heavy-hearted, especially as I look back through history and I see that we have never been during a time without war. We can't just live together. We got to fight. We got to kill. We got to maim. We got to steal. We got to take. Because we're never satisfied. War has been around as long as we've been in existence. And one of the greatest tactics of war would be to say, I may not be able to conquer you, but I can come and take what's most precious to you, and I can destroy that, and thereby hurting you. And this is exactly what the plan of Satan is. He knows he can't destroy Jesus. He can't finish the Son of God, but there are people that he can finish. He can finish God's most prized possession, you, me, humanity. And so we wonder, why is he always picking on me? 
Well, he's picking on us because he wants to hurt the Son of God by hurting you and me. But the beautiful thing here is that we know that the Bible tells us that if you want to compare the power of evil against good, a lot of people think it's like an arm wrestling match. You know, you got evil and good, and they're fighting, and who's going to win the match? Is it going to be evil, or is it going to be good? It's no contest, you guys. Evil has no comparison to God's good. God's good is so good that when he comes back and his glory shines, it will destroy every adversary of God. That's powerful. We're not going to be using guns. We're not going to be throwing spears. We're just going to watch our Messiah just blow them away with his great power. It doesn't even compare. There was a time in history where Lucifer really thought he was about something, and he was. He was a very important part of heaven but the Bible tells us that pride kind of of got to him and he started exalting himself in his own mind he started thinking you know I am so cool I want to be the one that people bow down to I want to be the one that sits in the place of authority and this is the very thing that caused his downfall because there really is truly one authority So Jesus heals this man, and the first thing they say, is this the son of David? The phrase, the son of David, is the Old Testament words. As a matter of fact, we're studying it on Wednesday nights. And oh, footnote, I'd love to have you guys come out for prayer with us on Wednesday at 5 o'clock. We have a great little group, and we go down in the fellowship hall. We spend an hour in prayer. We have some food together, and then we have Bible study at 6.30. So if you can make it, please come. We would love to have you come. So these two ideas that are in the church, both radical on each ends of the spectrum, and the Pharisees, well, they saw that the multitudes were asking the question, the son of David. The son of David is the Messiah. The son of David is the one whose bloodline the Messiah would come through. As Jesus did. God told David that your throne will be forever. Because Jesus will sit on it. He is the son of David. He's the one they were waiting for. But when the Pharisees heard it. Right away they got defensive. Right away they said this guy. He's not casting out demons with the power of God. He's doing it by the power of Beelzebub. who is the ruler of the demons. Now, if you look in the the scripture, Beelzebub comes from the word Baal, Zebub, which means the Lord of the flies. Nice title, huh? It's kind of a spin on words. Because the cultures outside the Jewish culture that worshiped Baal, the word was Baal Zabul, which means the prince of lords, the prince of gods. So they took it and they changed it. But Jesus, he knew their thoughts, it says. Who? what does that tell you today? How does that make you feel sitting in your seat right now that Jesus knows your thoughts? Boy, I wish I'd got hurry up and get done, man. I'm really huh? I'm hungry, man. All this demon stuff is making me feel uncomfortable. Kind of screechy in my seat. Jesus knows our thoughts before we even think them. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city, or house, or country, or state, 
divided against itself, cannot stand. Great reasoning. One of the things I love about Jesus and his teachings, they make sense, they're simple, and they're logical. Very logical. He goes on to expound on it when he says, if I cast out demons by this Beelzebub, then who are your sons casting them out by? Because there were Jews at the time who claimed that they had the power to cast out demons. Pharisees, religious leaders. So if they're casting out demons with the same authority that Jesus is by the authority of Satan... Well, logic will tell us that their kingdom cannot stand. But he says in verse 28, If I cast demons out by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come to you. Surely the kingdom of God has come to you. You know, I think there's many ways to look at that phrase, the kingdom of God. There's a place in the scripture where Jesus says, the kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of God is within you. And I think to myself, yeah, but I thought it was like this really cool place, like a giant Disneyland or something, right? Well, we're all going to live and be on rides and have fun every day forever. The kingdom of God is within you. Within you and within me, we have the capacity to allow the Spirit of God to dwell in us. And I might want to tell you this too. If you're here this morning and the Spirit of God dwells in you, you will never be possessed by a demon. They will never cohabitate. A demon will never cast out the Spirit of God. So if somebody comes up and tells you, well, you know, you got a demon of smoking. No, you got a bad habit. That's what you got. You know, Pastor Chuck, I remember years ago, he used to say, <coughs> people would come to him and say, hey, Chuck, people who smoke cigarettes, are they going to go to hell? And Chuck would say, no, but they'll smell like they've been there. Now, there's three different things that I want to mention to you in our time that we have left here. There's three different realms that we deal with as Christians, as human beings. John tells about it in the letter that he wrote that I read from today during our communion time today. But those three things are the world the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three things. All that is in the world, John said, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these are the things that bring us down. He didn't say it was a devil or a demon that did it. It's these influences The world, for instance, and he's not talking about the beautiful blue planet we live on. He's talking about the system of the world, the culture of the world, the ungodly, anti-God culture of the world that we find ourselves in, and its system of thinking. My heart breaks for our little ones to think that they're going to be raised in a culture We think our culture's messed up right now. You know, in 30 years when most of us are in heaven, I fear what it might be like for our children and grandchildren. Should the Lord tarry, (laughs) which I don't believe he will, but we have the world to contend with. We have the flesh to contend with. Our old nature, the selfishness. My flesh makes demands. My flesh wants its own way. And if it doesn't get it, it will pout. Yeah, it will throw a fit. Like the little child in Walmart that's on the floor flailing because mama won't let him have a bag of potato chips. My flesh does that. Paul wrote about the flesh. 
In Galatians chapter 5, he said, the acts of the sinful nature or the flesh, they're obvious. We all know what they are. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and every, and envy, and drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you, he said, as I did before, that those who live like that will not enter the kingdom of God. And there's that pesky devil. It's true. The devil uses the world against us. The devil uses our flesh against us. He uses our pride against us. He's looking for those weaknesses and those cracks. You know, Jesus went through the very same thing. He went out to the wilderness, and it tells us the devil came to him and tempted him three times. He tempted him in the flesh. He tempted him in his emotion, and he tempted him in his spirit. And when I say emotion, in, his pri in the pride of life, if you will. He tempted him in his flesh when he said, I know you're hungry, and since you're the son of God, just turn these things into bagels, all these rocks, right? With cream cheese on them. You can do whatever you want because you're the son of God. And he was trying to appeal to his flesh. And Jesus answered him with scripture. Whenever the enemy comes to tempt you and I, we should always use the word of God against it. That's where the power lies. It's not in your willpower. It's in God's word. He also tempted him with his pride. He tried to get him to show off. Man, if you'll, you know, if you'll get up on the temple and do a swan dive and all of Israel will see it and you know, all the major news people will be there and they'll be all over the world that Jesus dove off of the pinnacle and just gently floated to the ground as angels held him. Oh, man. You don't have to go to the cross. You can take a shortcut. Just show them what you got. Make a show of it. Oh, and by the way, if you'll kneel down to me, if you will worship me, he said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. You might say, how could the devil do that? Well, because they are his kingdoms right now. He has usurped them, but he does control them. And Jesus didn't argue with him. He just used God's word to fight back. And guess what it says? It says, and the devil left him. But not permanently, until a more opportune time. Believe me, the same strategy is at work in our lives today. Exactly the same. I'm thankful today that there's only three things that he can mess with us. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Not five, not four, not nine, just three. He is limited. He is controlled. He is not all powerful. Demon possession, describing a person under the effect or the control of a demon. Well, you know, people want to argue about that. Some might argue for various levels of such control. Maybe you got a little demon. Maybe you got a couple of them. You know, depending on how many you've got. Depending on how much you'll be affected by that. You know, sadly, a lot of people write it off. A lot of people don't take it serious. These people did. They were astonished. They were blown away. They thought, my goodness, this has got to be the Messiah. Let's go on. It says, how, verse 29, can one enter a strong man's house? And plunder his goods. Unless he first binds the strong man. And then he'll plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. There's no in between, folks. We're with him or we're against him. Now, I'd like to 
have, you know, wonderful, warm, fuzzy thoughts this morning and walk away thinking every single one of us is for him, right? We're all on his side, otherwise why would we be here today? But maybe some of you are struggling with that. Maybe some of you are kind of wondering in your hearts this morning, wait a minute, am I really with him? Am I trying to maybe like walk that fine line between the world and God? I know from experience that that line gets finer and finer and finer. And soon you fall off and generally to the wrong side. Jesus said, I want all of you. And when I say all of you, I mean all of you individually. He wants all of you. He wants all of us, but he wants all of me. He wants all of you. He wants to be the Lord of our life. He wants to be the most important thing in our life. Because he deserves it. Because he is the Lord. He is the one who brings mercy and forgiveness to anyone who will ask. You all qualify. Everybody outside this room qualifies. Because we are all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. Therefore, we qualify for God's grace and God's forgiveness. It's amazing to me that there are some things that are established in life, in existence, that never, ever change. And I'm glad to know this morning that one of those things is His love for you and me. We'll never change. Now, we tend to change. We might wiggle-waggle around a little bit here and there. We might get bumped around by the things of the world. We might get crushed by the things of the world. But we've come here this morning because we're looking for something more than just existence. We're looking for something more than just putting up with the garbage and getting up and doing the same thing day after day. We're here this morning because we need hope. We need new life. We need forgiveness. And that can be Hours at the asking. Because I believe this morning that you and I can be victorious. I believe that God can do great things through you. But you have to believe that too. And not only do you have to believe it, but you have to step out into it. You know, there's not a Sunday that I come up here that I'm not trembling in my boots. It's an awesome responsibility to come up here before you and talk to you about these things. I never felt qualified. I never felt good enough. And this is what I hear from all of my brothers and sisters many times. Well, I can't do that. Who am I? I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified. You know, God doesn't always call those who are qualified. You know that, don't you? but he always qualifies those who he calls. I love that. So I want to encourage you. Let's just not be in a, a mere existence. Let's grow. Let's move forward. Let's find out what God has for us and for you individually and for your family and discover it because it's a wonderful journey. Amen? Why don't we have the worship team come on up? If you think you need prayer this morning for anything, uh, Lonnie and Chris will be available right over yonder there by the window. I know you can't see them, but they will appear there any moment now. I just want to encourage you, even while they're playing these last couple songs. Maybe you're feeling this morning, maybe you're, maybe you're just not aligned with God like you would like to be. And one of the first steps in that is to humble ourselves and to say, yes, I do have an issue. Yes, I do need help. And to come and get prayer. I'd encourage you to do that. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today for your word. And Lord, we know that some of these are difficult topics. 
hard to teach, hard to understand. But the one thing that we can walk away with today, Lord, is the fact that we have victory in you. No matter what the difficulty might be. Lord, from the most minor physical ailments to the greatest spiritual battle, you are there with us to never leave us, never forsake us, to walk us through, to show us that there's light on the other side of that tunnel and that we can grow in that tunnel. We can be strong in that tunnel with you. Lord, I want to pray for us as a church that you would continue to bless each one, each family, each heart, Lord. You know our needs before we ask. Therefore, we trust you with everything. In Jesus' name, amen.